many millions, but only one Earth. Each man's need is that of his neighbor, for all there is to share is the wealth of the world. snow-capped mountains and dark jungles, wide rivers, boundless grasslands, rich in resources that lay untouched since the world began, wild, treacherous, unknown. A land of dark and primitive contrast, plenty and scarcity richness and poverty. Here lived Africa's peoples, buried in their jungle, too backward to realize the inheritance it offered, the untapped resources of their vast continent. Human need crying in the wilderness. The only answer, the magic of the witch doctor, superstition, age-old fears, recurring plague. In Africa, in its jungles and in its villages, wealth lay wasting. In the 19th century came the first stirrings of great change. Then for Africa began an era common to all great continents, lands whose size and virgin wealth drew forth extremes in men. The gambler and the missionary, the thief and the honest trader, the despoiler and the man of vision, those who came only to take and those who had something to give in exchange. This was a dark chapter relieved by the light that the wisest brought into Kenya, the Gold Coast, Nigeria, the Sudan, and into the lands of the Congo. The Congo, a river 3,000 miles and more, draining one and a quarter million square miles of jungle and plains, an area 16 times the size of England. Here, growing in profusion in the forest, was a species of palm, whose fruit yielded an oil, an oil that meant food to those who lived there. Once to obtain the oil from the fruit, my people knew no other method than the one, old and primitive. Two sticks and a wisp of dried grass coaxed into a smoldering flame. For thus it was that man made fire since the world was young. Then the clusters of fruit, broken and boiled in an earthenware jar, Afterwards, we were pounded with pestle and mortar into a mash ready for the presses. Machinery crude but effective that served their simple needs. For out of the press, after much twisting and squeezing, dripped a rich oil, the hidden wealth of a backward people that was soon to be wealth for the world. In 1911, an Englishman by the name of William Lever, later to become Lord Leverhulme, was granted a concession by the Belgian government. 
to develop large-scale production of palm oil in the Belgian Congo. Then, in lonely villages, the people listened to the white man, weighed their proposals to work and harvest the land, and having listened, they consulted among themselves. On their answer, much depended, for enterprise like this needed cooperation and goodwill. But at last, it was agreed. I remember how we built our first mill, 900 miles upstream, deep in the jungle. Everything brought up by barge, manhandled into the forest. The first thing was to clear the site. Sounds so easy now in these days of bulldozers and mechanical shovels. Still, together we did it. Belgians, Britons and the men of the Congo. We used bricks and mortar from the mud of the forest. Simple forges. Methods and tools evolved or adapted by a little ingenuity on the spot. Yes, it was pioneering, all right. Improvisation, tears, and sweat. We brought in boilers weighing tons and had to cut a road for them first, hauling them from one length of rail to the other. Heartbreaking patience for a few yards an hour. For ropes, we used creepers from the trees. It needed guts and confidence and goodwill from all concerned. Our long-term plan was to cultivate palms ourselves, to use scientific methods in place of the haphazard growth of the jungle. But at first, we were dependent upon the wild fruit the people could gather. To our markets, set up in the villages, they came in from far and wide. For many, this was their first contact with the outside world. It was strange enough for us, it was doubly strange for them. And they little thought or even guessed of the great changes that were to come. When it came to clearing for our own plantations, there was only one thing in the way what looked like a million years of jungle. The African jungle can be a ruthless enemy, and so we fought it ruthlessly. When it was all over, we'd still find many of those great tree trunks undestroyed. So then it was once more into the breach, with axes and crowbars, cutting and chopping, levering the trunks to the side for time and the weather to finish off. Only by such methods did we plant our palms. Yes, the soil of the Congo was rich with promise. But only by such labor did men turn it into wealth. Cotton, copper, zinc, palm oil. New towns, factories, railways, airlines. What was sown with struggle and patience 
now yields a precious harvest. A hundred thousand acres of cultivated palms, yielding oil for soap, for margarine, for fats vital to the world. And the trees which yield life for all the world now yield a better life for those who are born in their shade. Yes, in the Congo other seeds have taken root. Seeds that can one day reach a full maturity and yield another form of wealth that lies in human souls and sinews. This is a slower harvest that can be reaped only after many generations, after many more years of light and air, that light and air that will kill the rank growths of the jungle, superstition, ignorance and fear. To work on our plantations in the Congo, people come in from far and wide, many of them from pretty remote and backward villages. They are a simple people, and to them it's all a little strange, to say the least. They need understanding, patience, sympathy. We need them, and they need us. So it's in the interest of all to get them off to a flying start. But after the way they've been living, a flying star doesn't mean the same to them as it does to you and me. After all, they see a miracle even in a weighing machine. The first thing is to make sure that they are fit. And that's something new to them for a start. In fact, the battle against disease is probably the biggest fight we have in Africa. We even have to show them how to protect their own interests. When we give them an advance in pay, we have to make sure that they put their mark to a decent country. To make quite certain that they start with food in their stomachs, we give each family a free issue. And as they generally arrive only in what they stand up in, we've got to give them clothes as well. Later on, they will be earning and can buy for themselves. And then they get something which not many people get when they start a job. A house. Pretty simple and small, I admit, but self-contained. And what are they like when they get to the job itself? Well, when you realize the size of the plantations and the number of men working on them, you can see that the headaches are plenty. In Europe, we take skilled labor for granted. But in the Congo, it means training every man from scratch every plantation worker and mill hand, every clerk and office worker. And starting from scratch may mean starting with chaps who've never seen a screw or a screwdriver. But believe me, they learn all right. Yes, we learn. Once to obtain the oil from the flute, my people knew no other method than the one old and primitive. Two sticks and a wisp of grass coaxed into a smoldering flame. Then the clusters of fruit, broken and boiled in an earthenware jar. Afterwards, they were pounded with pestle and mortar into a mash ready for the presses. Then out of the press, after much twisting and squeezing, dripped a rich oil. Oil from the trees of the Congo, but oil now in quantities undreamt of. Thousands of tons a year. This was the wealth of the backward people, now become wealth for the world. When that siren blows, 
we know exactly what it means. It's the world outside calling for more of what the Congo can give. There's a world shortage of fats, and that means increased production. With our science and our experience, it shouldn't be difficult for us to improve and develop and get more oil. But for real progress, well, we know where the solution lies. It lies in the progress of the people. We've done a lot in the short time we've been here, 40 years. But 40 years can only be the beginning of a job this size. If we want to develop production, we've got to develop the community around us. The two things go side by side. Ah yes, sometimes the world is a little impatient. Sometimes it's easy to forget that we found other things in Africa too. And a lot of them are still here. Squalor, ignorance and disease. And such things by their nature have got to be tackled wherever you find them. We know what Africa can do for the world. Out here, you can see around you what the world can do for Africa. So much done, so much more to do. That is the story of the Congo, of Africa, of all lands rich in resources but unable to develop them alone. The drums beat in the Congo and the world has begun to listen. For there is more than one harvest. For the greatest wealth the world can know is in the pulse of its people wherever they live. So many millions, but only one earth. Each man's need is that of his neighbor, for all there is to share is the wealth of the world. <laughs> 